All right, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. A huge welcome to all of you as we get underway in our first week in 2021. We did over 500 broadcasts last year. I wanna say a huge thank you to all our teachers who joined us live and on YouTube in celebrating such amazing scientists and explorers from around the globe. So this week is off to a great start. We've already covered baby sloths eating flowers. Uh, Joe's overdoing astronauts and polar explorers right now, and we are diving in with one of our longest lasting and most favorite partners uh, in the Vermont Institute of Natural Science. So they do incredible work rescuing, rehabilitating, and re-releasing uh, injured birds of all kinds. We've done, I think, 20 plus programs of them over the last few years. And for the last 50 years, they've been doing really top-notch education work in highlighting the majesty of birds of prey. So I'm so excited to have Anna Morris here. She's one of our favorite educators. Anna, thank you so much for joining us today and take us away. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Jesse. It's really great to be here and doing these programs for you all. I understand there's quite a lot of you here today, so I'm super excited about that. My name is Anna. I am the lead environmental educator at the Vermont Institute of Natural Science, and our main mission is to inspire people to care about the natural world. We do so through education. These virtual programs are something new that we've been doing over the last year or so. Um, but we also go into the schools in our local community in Vermont and New Hampshire and help enhance the STEM education that's going on in there. We also have a research program and we've recently uh, started doing a variety of different projects on our local ecology and our local wildlife, such as tracking the movements of our uh, red-tailed hawk population here in Vermont throughout the winter. And of course, we do our wildlife rehabilitations. We have a bird hospital on site at our nature center, and we see birds from around the states of Vermont and New Hampshire in need of care from caring people like yourselves that find them and bring them into us. Um, I'll do a little plug for our rehabilitation clinic from last year. They saw over a thousand birds in care in their hospital. Uh, actually, 1,025 patients for the year 2020 which is more than 300 more than the last record-breaking year that we had, 700 patients in 2019. So it's been a, a, a very busy, growing little place, and we're so happy to provide this service for our wildlife and our community. Now, as it happens, some of the birds that come into care in our wildlife clinic are not able to be returned to the wild even after they recover from their injuries. If they had broke a wing, let's say, and one of those bones didn't heal properly, uh, maybe they can't fly as well as their wild cousins can. Or maybe they can no longer see out of one of their eyes or both of their eyes. That's a really kind of disadvantageous injury for a wild animal. And so we give them what we call a career change. And we offer these birds a chance to live here with us. And in turn, they become ambassadors. They help me do this education work, teaching people about their local wildlife species with a member of that species on hand. So I thought today it'd be really fun to introduce you to two of our education ambassador raptors. These are both birds of prey or uh, hunting birds that capture and kill their prey with their talons. Most people are familiar with uh, some of those types of raptors, the eagles, for example, the hawks, the owls. And today we're gonna focus specifically on one of my favorite groups, which is the falcons. So I've brought with me two ambassador falcons to meet you. And we've got this cool little setup around here. We're going to be talking about a lot of the different natural history of falcons and hopefully get to demonstrate some of their natural behaviors. So if you'll excuse me for five seconds, I'm going to go and get our very first ambassador bird and I'll be right back. Fantastic. While she's doing that, I'm ever so briefly going to bring up on the screen the website for the Vermont Institute of Natural Science. Check it out. Uh, again, amazing resources. You can learn about all our incredible birds there uh, and you'll see more in a second. Anna's coming back. I can't wait. All right. Here we are. So this is our very first ambassador bird who's going to be joining us today. I'm just getting his leash off because he'll do a few flights for us. But this is Westford. And Westford is an American kestrel. Now, if you're watching from Canada, don't worry. He's also found in Canada as well. The American in his name just refers to the fact that he's from North America and pretty much all over North America, from southern latitudes in Canada all the way down through Mexico and Central America. Now, the American kestrel, the kestrel part of his name, refers to the fact that he is a very, very small falcon. There's about 40 different species of falcons all over the world, and we might be familiar with some of them, like the peregrine falcon, for example. 
And maybe a dozen or so of those falcons are actually kestrels, which refers to these very, very small little guys. I'm holding him quite close to the camera so you can get a good kind of gander at all of his patterns and markings. And for some reason, the camera isn't quite focusing completely on him. But if I hold him back here like this, sort of level with my shoulder, you'll get a good sense of actually how big he is. He stands maybe six inches tall, and he weighs as much as a candy bar or a stick of butter, less than 100 grams. So he's a, a light little guy. And the kinds of things that he is interested in hunting and capturing in his talons are, as you might imagine, pretty small things. Small things like insects in the summertime. Big dragonflies, grasshoppers, crickets, katydids, uh, even big caterpillars he might like to eat. I've seen him eat a spider before. Uh, but the falcons in general, as a group, are also specialty bird hunters. These are birds that eat other birds. And how they accomplish this, how they are able to catch other birds right out of the sky, is what makes the falcons truly remarkable. I'll spin him around a little bit again so you can get a look at his wings. So those two long, black, pointy sets of feathers extending down off of his back that cross right over his tail, those are the very tips of this American kestrel's wings. And they're long and pointy and streamlined so that he can build up a tremendous amount of momentum and speed. He can build up speeds close to 45 miles an hour in level flight, so just traveling flat across a grassland or a meadow, which is where you typically find these birds. Oh, we've got an itch. Uh, and also maintain that speed so he's not being dragged back by the wind and the friction of the wind on his feathers. Having long, thin wings helps you travel faster. But being able to travel so fast means he also needs to steer. So you'll notice that he's got a rather long tail. That's another feature of the falcons. They have a pretty long tail, and that tail acts like a rudder that helps them steer in and out between trees and branches and brush while they're traveling at such high speeds. It's like their steering wheel, essentially. So he has long wings and a long tail. And you might also notice, if I can hold him up just a little bit closer, relatively long toes as well. Because he is a bird hunting bird and he's catching other birds right out of the sky, he needs to have a pretty decent reach. He needs to be able to grab things that are trying to get away from him, even while he's traveling so fast. So having those long, thin toes ensures that not only can he grab something, but then he holds onto it really tightly and securely, wrapping his toes around that dragonfly, that sparrow, that starling, even something up to the size of a morning dove he's probably going to go after. And he's going to hold onto it with his toes. But something the size of a morning dove, if you guys are familiar at all with those plump little brown birds that we sometimes see uh, hanging out underneath our bird feeders. Yeah, I know you're getting a little restless. These morning doves are probably a little bit bigger even than this kestrel. And so he is going to need another kind of fail safe, another kind of mechanism to help him actually dispatch with this morning dove, make sure he can eat it safely and it's not going to be struggling and bothering him. And so that's where his beak comes in. His little tiny curved or hooked beak, that's a characteristic of all of the raptors. The falcons all have that nice curve to their beak. But just behind that main curve on a falcon's beak is a notch called the tomial tooth. And that little tooth, that little snaggle tooth, is actually what he'll use to kill his prey. So once he's got that dove or that starling wrapped in his talons, it's not escaping, it's not able to go anywhere, he's going to lean down and bite on its neck with his tomial tooth. And that will snap the neck of the prey that he's caught, and it will be out and ready to be consumed by a kestrel or a whole family of kestrels. And that's a really cool thing that I want to talk about next, and I want to let Westford explore uh, some of the jungle gym that I've set up behind me, because he's that's clearly what he's into right now, uh, is the fact that they nest in a very special place for a falcon, which is tree cavities. Most falcons uh, and other birds of prey, the larger ones, nest in nests, in big sticks, nests in trees. But the small American kestrels will actually choose a hole inside of a dead tree, or even a hole inside of a man-made box just like Westford here is enjoying very much exploring his little nest box. 
Now he's probably going to hang out in there for a few minutes before he turns around and comes out. But this is something that uh, ordinary people working at home can do. No, that's the perch. There you go. <laughs> If you wanted to create good habitat for American kestrels and observe them hunting on your own time, you can construct a nest box just like the one that Westford was exploring back there. It's a little bit bigger than your typical uh, eastern bluebird or tree swallow nest box, but these guys will use it, will raise a family of perhaps four or five young at a time, they will use the meadows and the fields around the nest box eating insects, voles, small birds, and generally being helpful at controlling pets. Anna, sorry to stop you, Anna, if you can hear me. You went mute all of a sudden, like your, your audio just cut off entirely. <laughs> this keeps it exciting. Well, for what it's worth, while you're getting that set up and, and maybe like sign out and sign back in again in a second, don't know what happened. Um, this is like the most interactive bird presentation we've ever had. So for all the class that are here, you guys are super lucky to see all this. This is awesome. Um, yeah. So it's <laughs> gonna sort that out. Again, while she's doing that, uh, again, check out vinsweb.org. Amazing stuff there. All of our past programs are on our YouTube channel too. So if you want to check in. There you go, you're back, Anna. Perfect. Change the batteries. Cool. <laughs> uh, All right. Sorry about that, guys. Gosh, yeah. I um, <laughs> we have a problem with the acoustics in this room sometimes, and I thought I'd try out the microphone today, and apparently the batteries were on their last legs. So here we are uh, with the sound again. So these birds, I was talking about how you can uh, think of them as uh, helpful for agriculture, a farmer's best friend, eating all those little mice and rodents that are attracted to the farm because they're eating the farmer's crops, what is the farmer gonna do? Well, he could rely on the natural predators that are already in the ecosystem like American kestrels, and he might even encourage them by building nest boxes uh, for them to live and breed in. They do only breed once a summer, once a year, and they're a migratory species. So you might not expect them to spend the entire year in your field in the winter time. They might head south to places like the Carolinas, Florida, Texas, even as far south as Costa Rica. But they don't all leave. They're only partial migrants. I myself was just up in uh, Addison County here in Vermont, which is a lot, a lot of farm field, and it's a huge place for raptors to gather in the winter time. And I saw two American kestrels. I also saw a member of their uh, Another species, their larger cousin, the Merlin, uh, after whom the wizard was named. There was a Merlin and some American kestrels hanging out uh, in that part of the world. So are you going to uh, come back on the glove, or are you basically just content to fall asleep there? There you go. Awesome. So Westford, I'll tell you a little bit about his story and how he ended up here with us. He is a cute little guy, and he actually has no physical injury. The reason why he's here with us is because he was raised by people. Uh, and while that doesn't seem like a big deal to us, because we are people, it's a pretty big deal for a wild animal. Because how these birds learn about who they are and what they're supposed to do in their role out in the ecosystem is by uh, watching their parents and learning from their parents. That's what we do too. Unfortunately, he was taken out of his nest or found outside of his nest by a human family who thought, well, we're going to try and take care of him. And I admire the fact that they wanted to care for their local wildlife, but they really didn't know how to do it because we're not kestrels. We don't know how to do it. Licensed wildlife rehabilitators, like our staff at the Wild Bird Hospital here at Vins, we can approximate what an American kestrel should learn about and we put them in with other members of their species. We try to hide our own human faces from them so that they don't identify with us or become imprinted. But unfortunately, Westford didn't experience that, and he became totally imprinted on his human parents. So he thinks of himself as a little person. He is perfectly content in a setting like this, sitting on my glove next to me, basically falling asleep in the middle of my exciting program here. Uh, and that is not a really great way for him to be in the wild. He needs to be vigilant for predators. He needs to be finding his own food. So it was decided that he would be much better off in human care for the rest of his life. 
which is unfortunate for him and for the ecosystem that's missing out on having its own uh, kestrel to take care of it. So that's a little bit about this tiny falcon. I'm wondering if you guys, uh, if you right now have a question or two, or if uh, I can just move right on to the second bird that we're gonna meet. I think it's kind of fun if we go on to the second one and we can highlight it a little bit later, but yeah. Thanks, Anna. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to sneak him back in the box, and then I'm going to bring the other bird around, so a little furniture change. Cool. Well, I can't wait. And I was just going to mention in the last little interlude there for a second that if anyone is keen to, to see owls in particular, which are, are my close to my heart, uh, we've done many videos and all sorts of other birds at the Vermont Institute on our YouTube channel. They're all there. You can tune in. Just type in Vermont Institute. They'll all pop up for you on Exploring by the CD Group. So I encourage you to do that. And uh, yeah, it looks like we're getting ready for our, our second bird. Uh, a welcome into our four classes joining in across Ontario and our class in Texas on YouTube. So nice to have you guys all here. Over 250 kids from around North America in this broadcast. So welcome in all of you. Looks like Anna's getting ready. We've got a, a, a secretive cat cage. Hi. <laughs> hey, there we are. There we go. Wonderful. So this is the second falcon that we are going to meet. This is Hawaii. Hawaii is his name because that's where he's from, uh, of all places. And you might recognize him because he is that most famous and well-known, it seems, of all the falcon species, the peregrine falcon. You can see a little bit, he's just going to sit right on this perch here while we hang out. That's where he's most comfortable rather than sitting on a glove like uh, Westbird was. So he's just going to hang out here, but you can already see the similar characteristics that the Kestrel had. He's got those long, thin, pointed wings. He has a relatively long tail as well. Um, but he's got a much, much bigger body size. If our Kestrel weighed as much as a stick of butter or a candy bar, this peregrine falcon weighs more like a pound, like a whole big loaf of bread, um, to, to continue the food comparisons. And so he's able to build up much, much faster speeds. We talked about level flight a flight flat over a field with the American Kestrel and the fact that he could do about 45 miles an hour. A peregrine falcon is capable of speeds close to 70 miles an hour in flat level flight, which is faster than a cheetah can run across the savanna. So already, this guy is the fastest animal on Earth. However, that's not actually where peregrine falcons get their famous um, moniker of being the fastest animal on earth. It's in their hunting style. These birds, like the American kestrel, also hunt other birds. I'm feeding him little pieces of chicken right now. Um, so hopefully he would never go after a backyard chicken. He's interested in a quail, a pheasant, a pigeon, a partridge, something like that. And in order to catch that bird, he's going to be looking for a flock of pigeons or a flock of quail flying around in the open spaces of his habitat. And once he spots that flock, he is going to fly above them and then flip over, tuck his wings in close to his body like they are right now, and just drop down out of the sky on top of them in an enormous dive. This dive is called a stoop, and they reach speeds of over 240 miles an hour in this stoop. It's amazing to me not only that they achieve that speed, which is way, way, way faster than most cars are capable of going, but they can survive that as well. So a lot of his adaptations are about surviving traveling at very, very high speeds. He has a nictitating membrane over his eyes, which is something that many birds have, to be fair. He has a third eyelid that's translucent that closes from inside to outside over his eyes to protect them while he's falling through the air from getting scratched by debris. Also, his tears are a little bit more viscous than our tears are. Our tears are like liquid, like water, but his are more like jelly, and they stick better to the surface of his eyeball so that his eyes don't dry out. He also has a little tiny bone inside of his nose. You can see his nostrils pretty well there, but right inside of his nostril is a little spiral-shaped bone. It looks like the inside of a seashell. And this allows him to breathe more easily while he's traveling at 240 miles an hour. I don't know about you, if you've ever stuck your head out the side of a moving vehicle uh, going down the highway, pretty hard to breathe. So he needs to catch that air and slow it down before it goes into his lungs, which is exactly what that bone is designed to do for him. 
But he still has the same apparatus for catching his prey once he catches up to it in that dive. He's got those long, long, I call them pipe cleaner toes that he's able to wrap all the way around that bird's body. So once he's grabbed onto that pigeon, he's got a really, really good hold on it. And he'd use his tomial tooth in order to kill it. Now the disadvantage that our peregrine falcon here at Binns has, and the reason why he's not in the wild, is that he doesn't have a tomial tooth, which is a strange thing. He actually doesn't have much of a beak. His injury is to his face. He actually had a collision with a brick wall when he was a very young bird. He flew right into the side of a building and it broke off the top part of his beak. Now, Fortunately for him and for us, a bird's beak actually grows throughout their lifetime, just like your fingernails and your hair grow. So the rescuers that found him on the island of Hawaii brought him to the Honolulu Zoo for care, and they were optimistic that his beak would grow back after that accident. But unfortunately, the growth plate inside of his skull, the thing that causes the beak to grow, is what was damaged, and his beak has never, ever grown back properly. So I feel perfectly comfortable hand feeding him because even though peregrine falcons do have a very sharp beak that's designed for crunching through the bones of another bird, he doesn't really have that beak. Honestly, it feels to me like two pistachio shells gently pinching against each other. That's, that's the extent to which he can bite down on things. And that's not a good thing for a wild peregrine falcon. He needs to be able to bite down really hard on his prey to tear it up into bite-sized pieces if he's caught something that's too big to swallow whole. And so here at Vins, we're able to cater to his needs. We're able to cut his food into tiny little bite-sized pieces so that he doesn't have to worry about killing and tearing things up. And in terms of uh, his personality as well, peregrine falcons, high-speed travelers, eating a lot of food all the time, they tend to be very high energy. They're just bouncing around, they've got places to go and things to do. So having him sitting on a glove is not really the greatest thing for him. He doesn't like it. He's spooked easily. He uh, would uh, like to dive off the glove and try and go somewhere else. It was, it was just messy. So rather than uh, have him do that, we decided that we could try uh, doing more education on his own terms. So he loads himself into his little uh, cat kennel and he hops out and he sits on a perch and expects to be fed roughly every 30 seconds and then he'll go right back in when we're done uh, and and that's the way of things uh, with him so we like to be able to do that now peregrine falcons in general I think they're very well known for their high speed but also for their conservation story this is a story of a bird that once went extinct in the eastern part of the United States but environmentalists People who simply cared about these birds, they all came together and helped save the peregrine falcon from the brink of extinction by advocating for um, the elimination of a pesticide called DDT that was being used in the environment. This pesticide was toxic to peregrine falcons. And as soon as we recognized that, the whole country came together and advocated to get rid of this chemical. And now we have peregrine falcons all over our cities, all over the United States, taking care of those pest species, larger ones like pigeons and the American kestrel can do, but helping us out. So we help them out so that they can continue to help us out. And it's something that we should think about how we can better change how we live our lives and make decisions about how we do things to continue to help these birds because it's super important and they're just, they're just great. So why not? <laughs> That's all I have. What a, a great message to leave on, and thank you so much for getting uh, the chance, sure. giving us the chance to meet Hawaii and Westford. That was awesome. Uh, we already have tons of questions pouring in on YouTube, and I know our, our live classes have a bunch too, so what I'm going to do is start with Miss Foster's class in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Welcome in, guys, and I'd love to take your first question. Hi, Miss Foster. Hi. Hey. 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 <laughs> Um, when you see a hurt bird, who do you contact? Oh, very good question. So when you see a bird, who do you contact? So if you find a bird that is injured and you want to make sure it gets the right kind of help, what do you do? Uh, in most states, the Fish and Wildlife Department keeps a list of all of the licensed rehabilitators in the state. So they'll have a list that says this person lives in this town and they are licensed to, are you done? Are you going to go home? 
<laughs> they're licensed to uh, take care of those animals in need. Hawaii is telling me that he wants to go home, so that's what we're going to do. Um, but I'm happy to continue to answer the questions. So yeah, getting in contact with your Fish and Wildlife Department is the best way to uh, figure that out, figure out which rehabilitator is closest to you. Yeah. You want to go in? You're not quite done yet. Don't want to go in yet. This is a perfect, perfect moment while you're trying to get Hawaii to, to, <laughs> to choose a decision um, to mention that uh, Miss Richard's class uh, in Guelph, Ontario, uh, one of their students would like you to know personally, Anna, that they have an African gray parrot named Elmo. So we're talking about all of the great bird names here, and I wanted to pass that along. Yeah, so. yeah that's a good bird name. Uh, I want to go to Miss Howard's class now, joining us in Ottawa, Ontario, our capital. If you want to demute your mic, you're good to go and come in. And that's just a note for all our teachers. You can all demute your mic. We can only hear you when I bring you in. So Miss Howard, come on in. Go for it. Hello. So some of our questions. Um, how fast can the American Kessler fly? Or in how many kilometers or miles does it fly? Or does it travel oh. usually? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Good question. So how fast can the American Kessler travel? Um, the level flight number, that 45 miles an hour, I don't know what that is in kilometers per hour, but on our roads in America, it's like that's like a middling fast speed. Uh, in their dives, though, they've been clocked at speeds of up to 90 miles an hour, which is definitely a fast speed. Yeah. It's uh, a third of what the peregrine's capable of, but it's still up there. Yeah really quite amazing that animals that are as small, relatively speaking, I mean, I know you said that the peregrine was much bigger than the size of our loaf of bread, but this is a tiny animal comparatively. Yes. The fact that they can hit these speeds is unbelievable testament to how powerful uh, they are for such tiny Absolutely. animals. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, Mr. Shattuck class joining us in Chalk River, Ontario. I'm going to come to you guys next. Go for it. Perfect. So, Caden, if you want to unmute your mic, and hopefully they'll be able to hear you. So we can't, so Mr. Shadow, you can repeat that. I can hear that something was being said, but yeah. Okay, so he wants to know if there's any specific diseases that attack peregrine falcons or the Kessels. Yeah. Oh, very good question, specific diseases. Um, that's a, such an interesting question because it's one of the things that we don't see a lot uh, is like natural diseases um, into our, our wildlife clinic, uh, which is probably a good thing because we don't want our resident birds to catch those diseases. Uh, one thing we do worry about constantly is uh, West Nile virus, which can affect uh, all raptors. West Nile virus is uh, uh, in the bird population across North America, and it's unfortunately deadly to corvids. So crows and ravens, if they catch it, they don't survive it. Uh, but raptors can survive West Nile virus. Even so, we actually vaccinate our birds every spring against it. Oh. Um, another thing that we do worry about is specifically for the northern dwelling species of birds like um, uh, jeer falcons, peregrine falcons, rough-legged hawks, golden eagles, is a disease called aspergillosis, which is essentially a fungus that grows in your lungs. Uh, <laughs> and it's a disease of northern dwelling birds that are brought to more southern climates. So a, a, a jeer falcon that lives in the Arctic that is suddenly asked to live in Texas it is more at risk of that illness. Yeah. Very cool question from Mr. Shaddix class. I don't think we've ever got that one before, so thank you. No, yeah. Um, I'm gonna go to Ms. Barr's class, joining us in Clareton, Pennsylvania. If you wanna demute your mic, I know there were some tech difficulties earlier, but I'd like to bring you in, so just demute that microphone and you'll be good to go for a question. Hi, guys. Okay, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. <laughs> okay, I am having some, um, camera issues. Hold on one second. That's okay. We, as long as we can hear you, we're good. Yeah. Okay, good. So does anybody have any questions? Just unmute yourself. Thinking about it. Dun, dun, dun. Hold on, they're just unmuting themselves. Hold on one second. Uh, uh, well, we'll take one question right now and we'll come back for another one in a minute too, okay? Go ahead, Javen. Okay, I think, I think, oh, Charlie, go ahead. Can a bird regrow its, <clears throat> sorry, its talon? Very cool. Oh, Thanks. yeah. Very good question. Yeah. Can they regrow their talon uh, up to a certain point? Again, it's, it's like your fingernail. Um, if, you, if you cut the right part of your fingernail, it will grow back. If you cut a little bit deeper than that, it's going to grow back kind of funky. If you cut off your fingertip, <laughs> 
your fingernail is never going to grow back. So it's the same with the talon. If you cut off some of it, it will grow back. Um, but after a certain point, you're cutting into bone, and that's not going to grow back. Um, Hawaii, fortunately, has a beautiful set of eight curved talons. Um, and I'm very fortunate that he chooses to take food with his beak all the time rather than grab my hand and then bring it up to his mouth like some of our other birds would prefer to do. Yeah. Keep going with those. Um, great question, guys. All right, I'm going to go to Ms. Duncan's class joining us in San Antonio, Texas. I think we have more classes in San Antonio than any other place in North America, so it's always nice to go there. Uh, if you want to just demute your microphone, you are good to go. Hi. Oh, could you repeat that? It's a little bit of an echo. What do vultures eat? What do vultures eat, Anna? What do vultures eat? Oh, very good question. Vultures, it depends on the vulture, but the vultures that we see commonly here in Vermont are the turkey vultures, um, and they're across North America as well. They are what we'd call an obligate scavenger, which means they can only eat dead things. They don't hunt like a peregrine does. They're not going to grab onto a, a bird or a small mammal. They are going to soar around in the sky and actually smell rotting meat like roadkill, carcasses in the woods, and fly down and start eating at those carcasses. So they only eat dead things, but they'll eat any dead thing, yeah. deer, a rabbit, a raccoon. Um, yeah. Yeah. Great, great question, man. And I love the, the big cat mask. That's awesome. <laughs> Uh, all right, let's go to Ms. Michael's class in Glenview, Illinois. They've got a whole bunch of questions. So, Ms. Michael, come on in. Okay, well, a lot of people wanted to know more about how you work with these birds. In particular, Henry and Rosalie and Monse all wanted to know how you teach them not to hurt you and whether when you first bring them in, they yeah. try to hurt you. Great question. That's a really good question. Um, yeah, it's... It's interesting because the birds that end up in our education program, on our education team, like Hawaii, they are very, very special individuals. And they are birds that have shown us, while we're working around them, that they're capable of being comfortable with us in our, in our presence. And it's less about them wanting to hurt us and more about them feeling the need to defend themselves. So if I were to you know, walk up to one of our fresh out of the wild rehabilitation owls and say, hey, get on my arm, that owl might lash out because they think that I'm going to hurt them. Uh, so it's, it's a, a slow process of kind of getting to know each other and figuring out uh, that level of trust, which of these birds are willing to give us a lot of trust. And some birds that we see are just not willing to do that. And so we don't ask them to do the harder stuff, like sit calmly on a perch while talking to a TV screen. Um, so there, there definitely are, you know, I have been injured by birds. And I say that pretty much 100% of those instances, it's been my fault. It's been me overstepping um, the trust that they've given me and just not, uh, not reading their body language well enough to to say that they were telling me to back off. Yeah, I love that question from our Illinois students. Uh, whenever we talk about live animals and, and you know rehabilitation centers, uh, this is a really, really common question. And it all boils down to respect and building up that trust with the animal, just like you would with a person. Uh, in the wild, you should not approach a wild bird and try to pick it up. That will probably end poorly for you or the bird. Um, but in this sort of setting, it's a great way to understand and, and explain and showcase these really amazing animals. So great question, guys. I, I can elaborate on that for, for just one second because actually yesterday Hawaii had to go to the vet to get x-rays done uh, and that, that was pulling from our trust bank. I, I told him to go into the crate and he did and when the crate opened he was at the veterinarian which is his least favorite place on the planet um, and then today I asked him to go into the crate again and he knows that he could go to the veterinarian but he also could come out and have fun and eat food. And he chose to go in anyway. So he didn't blame me for yesterday um, because we've built up such a, a, a big bank of good experiences over the years. Yeah. So there you go. To all our students, you guys are literally making up for going to the vet. So way to go, yeah. all our kids. <laughs> Um, I want to take a quick question from YouTube and then I'm going to come back to Ms. Foster's and do another round. So uh, related to your animals, Anna, and also related to Elmo the parrot, how do you tell a bird's gender? How can you tell if it's a boy or girl? <laughs> 
That's such a good question because you can't. <laughs> Most of the time, it's very, very difficult. There are some birds um, like cardinals or mallard ducks that it's obvious because the feather colors are different between the boys and the girls. Uh, in the raptors, the biggest difference is actually size. So the males are smaller than the females almost across the board. Hawaii, we are relatively certain is a male because he's pretty small on average for a peregrine falcon. But we don't 100% know. Uh, and the only way we could know is through a DNA test. So African gray parrots are the same way, so far as I know. In most of the African gray species, you can't tell by looking at their feathers. You just have to um, either assign them a gender or not, uh, or take a DNA test. <laughs> <laughs> which involves one of those dreaded vet visits, so we can... Yes, exactly. So, <laughs> why bother? Yeah. Why bother? But great question, guys. All right, back to Alabama. Let's go check in with Miss Foster. Come <laughs> in. What do they do to protect their eggs since humans can't touch them? Yeah. What do they do... To protect their eggs since humans can't touch them? Oh yeah, what do they do to protect their eggs? I, exactly, so, so one of the best ways that birds protect their eggs is by building a nest up in a tree, it's the, in a place that's very hard for humans to access. Peregrine falcons, I didn't mention where they build their nests, on the side of a cliff face. So you can't even climb a tree to get there, you have to climb up a cliff, and that's often uh, you know, too dangerous for most predators to do. Um, nest predators are things like foxes or weasels or snakes, that could climb into a nest and eat the eggs. Um, but peregrines get by that by just building on the sheer cliff wall on a little ledge. Um, uh, also, many raptors, as, as many birds are, very defensive of the nest territory. So if you uh, are approaching a nest site, uh, even if you don't know that that's what you're doing, suddenly a bird might come out of the air and take in a swipe at you at the back of your head because they're protecting their nest. They want you gone uh, from that area. Uh, to that end, uh, and also to prevent, you know, disturbing them in that way, at least Fish and Wildlife here in Vermont, they close off certain areas of uh, nature trails during the peregrine falcon breeding season so that people don't c come anywhere near the nest and don't risk upsetting the parents. Yeah, great question, guys. And for our Ontario classrooms, we'll all know this experience of red-winged blackbirds. I think everyone's been hit <laughs> by one at some point or other, so it uh, keeps us on our toes here. Uh, Ms. Howard, uh, speaking of Ontario, Ms. Howard coming back in from Ottawa, go for it. Uh, so I've tried to combine some of the questions, um, but how many birds or species of birds um, do you save a year and how many do you currently have there? Oh, wow. Good question. Species is a really good question because I don't, I really don't know the answer to that. I can give you a ballpark, which is like more than 25, but less than oh. 60, I want to say, <laughs> something like that. Wow. Um, of the thousand patients, like 200 to 300 of them were robins. Um, so there's definitely like, they, they aggregate. Um, and th so far this year, we have accepted 14 patients since the beginning of the year. So that's about one a day, um, which is also atypically high. I think this time last year, we only had four patients in care. The winter is a much slower time. Okay, great question, Ms. Howard. All right, let's go to Mr. Shattuck. Uh, come on back in, go for it. Uh, all right, so hopefully Olivia can uh, get through this time. Thinking about it. Olivia, do you want to unmute yourself there and try your question? Sure, uh, my question was, how do you hold the birds that way they, uh, it doesn't hurt them? Yeah. How do you hold a bird in a way that doesn't hurt them, Anna? Oh, yeah. Very good question. Uh, it depends on what you're trying to do. If you are rescuing a bird that has been injured and you're trying to get it into a box to get it to a rehabilitator, um, the, the best way that we recommend people doing it is to cover the bird with a towel and then pick up the entire towel and bird <laughs> thing together. Um, that way you're not really touching or squeezing any part of the bird itself. You're just kind of gently moving this bird and towel um, association somewhere else. Um, there are ways that uh, researchers and scientists and 
uh, people like me, if I have to you know, restrain Hawaii for a veterinary checkup, there are ways to do that safely, uh, both to keep the person safe and the bird safe, such as controlling where all their limbs are. Um, basically, I don't want his legs to be kicking around and possibly grabbing at things, and I don't want his wings to be flapping around and hitting things and maybe breaking feathers and all that. So you want everything like as nicely contained as possible without squeezing. Because he, you know, ultimately he's a peregrine, he's a beefy, beefy bird, but he's small compared to uh, us and our strength. Yeah. One thing sort of counter to that, that um, one of my colleagues likes to tell a story of they found amusing is the raptors are incredibly strong. Many of them are stronger than us. And in order to trim the talons on a great horned owl, for example, who has a grip strength that's much, much stronger than a human being's, if our great horned owl doesn't want her toes trimmed, it can take two or three people to coax her to open one of her toes. So in that circumstance, we don't worry about us hurting them because we physically can't. They're way stronger than we are. Yeah. That is wild. I'm always glad when we can tell that story because it's so, so neat to think about the power of these really tiny animals. Uh, yeah, awesome. yeah. All right. Um, by the way, we're going to take some YouTube questions in a minute. I'm going to go to Ms. Lundston's class next because I know you're kindergartners and you're trying to run at the vet, which is great. Ms. Barr, I'll come to you in a second, and Ms. Michael will wrap up in a minute. I also think we can all agree that if Mr. Shattuck were to do voiceovers for us, it would be amazing because you've got a great voice. Um, Ms. Lundston, uh, come on in. Just demute that mic and you're good to go. Hi. Can Hi. your falcon do a trick? <laughs> this, is, this is a trick. I mean, <laughs> I, I taught him how to do this. Um, he doesn't do things like jump through flaming hoops. He doesn't do backflips. Um, we don't ask our birds to do things that they wouldn't naturally do. Uh, even so, walking into a dark box, having the box move around, and then walking out of the dark box and sitting perfectly still on this little round thing is not something that he would find himself doing in the wild. So it's something that he absolutely had to learn. Um, so while he doesn't do tricks per se, um, we do train him to do behaviors like this one. Nice. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, that's great, Anna. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm going to take some really rapid fire ones. Miss Wu's class, second reader, Alejandro Houston wants to know what is the tiny falcon's favorite food? Ooh, what is the tiny falcon's favorite food? I'll tell a funny story about him because we try to give him live prey when we can, insects only. We don't give him live mice to catch or live birds to catch. Um, but if I find like a big cricket, I'll toss it in with him and he seems to enjoy that. But one time I had a container full of crickets that I'd caught in my garden and to keep the crickets alive until I got them to work, I had uh, blueberry halves in with the crickets. So the crickets could eat the blueberries and then the castor would eat the crickets. So I put the container of blueberries and crickets in with the American kestrel. And he dove down, grabbed something, and went right back to his perch. And I was like, cool, he got it. And then when I looked in the container, all the crickets were still there. And he was eating a blueberry, <laughs> which is not something that he should be eating. So I got it away from him and gave him a cricket instead. <laughs> so it's the opposite advice. You want all our kids to eat their veggies and fruits, but not the birds, just go straight Yeah, them. yeah. It's like, yay, a fruit. I'm like, you can't digest that. <laughs> um, awesome. All right, our final rapid fire three questions. Miss Caminiti's class joining us in Ottawa as well wants to know what's Hawaii's wingspan? What is Hawaii's wingspan? You show them your wingspan? That would be a cool thing for me to teach him if he could just do that. His wingspan is about three and a half feet. Um, yeah. It's not tremendously long, but it's longer than uh, a hawk of his size would be. Yeah. Very cool. Thanks, Anna. All right, Ms. Barr's class, after much Herculean effort, you've got the camera working. I'm so impressed. If you want to turn on your mic, you're good to go um, and ask us a question. Oh, you're muted still. Sorry. Oh. There you go. Okay, sorry. Okay, Avery, what was your question? And if you could repeat that for us, Ms. Barr, that'd be great. Oh. So she wanted to know if you work with anything, any animals other than birds and what and how many different kinds of birds you work with. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Cool. Good question. 
I'll say that the majority of my work is with birds, but we do have a collection of reptiles on site. So I work with two different species of turtles and a pair of corn snakes that we have as well. We have 15 birds on our education team of, I believe it's 12 species, because no, it's 11 species. We have two kestrels, two red tail hawks, two Harris hawks, two barn owls and stuff like that. So 15 birds of 11 species, roughly. Awesome, great question, guys. And then I know we could talk all day, we've got all more questions on YouTube than we could possibly answer, but I wanna wrap up with one more from Miss Michael's class, so back to Illinois, come on in and wrap us up. Well, Jaya, and I think the whole class wants to know how we can help the raptors, what can we do? Absolutely, and that is a perfect question because that's what I want everyone to take away from these educational programs. So there's a couple of specific actions that you can take. You can um, manage their habitat in a way that uh, makes it safe for them to live out there on their own. So leaving dead trees standing wherever you can or putting up nest boxes like the one that we saw the kestrel using. Um, also, not using poisons like rodenticides, like pesticides, like herbicides, chemical poisons in the environment not only hurt the birds directly, but also hurt their food, their prey. And so that's a way of making the habitat less habitable for them. Uh, another way that you can help these birds uh, and, their, and their prey as well is making sure that your windows aren't uh, causing unnecessary uh, bird strikes to happen. So sometimes we have this problem where birds hit glass windows because they don't see the glass. Uh, you can put up stickers or streamers or just uh, even little uh, strings of rope in a window to help break up that outline and you won't cause birds to uh, crash into that window. And another thing is to be uh, careful about what you use and what you throw away and where you throw it away. Um, an apple core, you might think that's biodegradable. Toss it out the window of your car while you're going by into the woods. But that often attracts animals to the side of the road and then they can get hit by cars. So we encourage people, yes, absolutely compost, absolutely recycle, but make sure your compost and your recycling are going into the appropriate bin and getting taken away uh, from human habitation so they're not attracting animals. Outstanding. Yeah. Well, thank you so, so much, Anna. And for people that are keen to contribute to the actual raptors at uh, Vermont Institute, again, go to their website, yeah. amazing stuff. You can donate and contribute to help uh, for the care of Hawaii, for Westward, and so many more amazing birds. Uh, and as you know, what we do at the end of every broadcast, I'm going to bring in our teachers. I know a lot of you are just independently at home, but I'll give you a chance to say a big thank you and goodbye to Miss Howard, Mr. Shattuck, Miss Barr, Miss Michael, and Miss Thank you so much. <laughs>